We're joined in the studio this morning on his uh, regular monthly visit by Kelton Hatch from Idaho Fish and Game. And uh, he drops in and we spend an hour talking about any number of topics related to hunting, fishing, uh, various other wildlife issues. And uh, Kelton is always willing to take your telephone calls. And, and if you know he does not have the answer, he generally goes, looks it up, and then comes back with some details. I, I give you credit for that. Um, you're, well, thanks. You're better than a lot of the politicians that we deal with. <laughs> I'll vote for you any day. Uh, well, I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to point out we are uh, into a period of year where, well, number one, the water is running really fast, but we don't have a terrible winter like we did last year. Good and bad in all of this. Yeah, well, you know, it, it's we we need, uh, regardless of what we think about snow, you, you don't like the white stuff, you're, you're tired of cold and stuff, we really need it. <laughs> you know, and that's the tough part this year is uh, – we don't have much snow in the mountains, and we really need the snow for irrigation of crops and for just for fish. They they don't do well in in dried up ponds, and so we we need this. It's it was interesting. I was out there at uh, Salmon Falls Creek Reservoir the other day, and there's boats on the lake already fishing. It's January. It's January in South Central Idaho, <laughs> and there's boats. There's like five boats out on the lake fishing, and they're catching some fish. And so, um, you know, not every lake is uh, is good at that because some of them have dirt or gravel type uh, launches. And but you can see the water rising at Salmon Falls Creek, and um, yeah, it, it's kind of concerning because our deer and elk are doing phenomenal. There's just nothing that's giving them grief up there. But um, you know, we we do need a little bit of precip so that we can fill those reservoirs. You know, we talk about the weather here, and uh, one reason, though, I appreciate it is because I saw a story this morning. Some guys were out golfing in Florida, and uh, they came across an alligator, and uh, there was a Burmese python wrapped around the alligator, but the alligator had the python's head in its mouth. And I thought, <laughs> I wouldn't want to stumble across something like that, and we don't have to worry about that around here. No. Fortunately, we have enough snow <laughs> that it keeps both those species out of this area. <laughs> so um, even though we're a little lean this year— uh, no, that 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 would be that'd be a different type of wildlife management. I mean, I guess they'd probably freak out too about a mountain lion yeah. eating a deer in somebody's front yard. But um, yeah, so but no, that 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 would be a. I never saw that story. That'd have been pretty pretty wild one to have, have had to have been called on. Yeah, uh, and I guess who wins those battles depends on who gets the jump first. Yep. Uh, <laughs> yep. You were going to talk a little bit. You've already mentioned fishing. Uh, well, a little I bit had. About that. It's yeah, we've got fishing going on right now. Uh, the streams, like I said, we're getting some runoff. We're seeing the the lake level rise. They are dumping some uh, fl- uh, water from the upper Palisades and stuff. They've got a little snow up there. They're trying to get ready for runoff. Hopefully we get some snowstorms this next week, but uh, right now fishing's pretty good, even in some of the streams, because it's not really dumping out of the mountains yet, because we're still getting cool at night, but it's open enough that people can get to a lot of those streams that are open year-round and fish. The big thing that we need to get to, uh, though, is um, we are going to be doing our revamping our regulations. Every three years we redo our regulations. It is a regulation cycle. Another thing that's happened is we have our Magic Valley Fisheries Management Plan. That com- that management plan will be rewritten this year, and so we're also looking for feedback on that. So if there's something that you'd like to see changed in the regulations, if there's something that like you'd like to see changed in the management of the fisheries or like to see something different, please give Doug McGargle a call over at the regional uh, office at uh, 208-324-4359, and you can talk to him there. Next month, um, I'm going to be on here, and we'll be talking about the public meetings um, that we're going to have for that. Um, It's interesting, Bill, on these um, big game, usually we can get a few people to show up at the meetings. Fisheries, a lot of time we sit around and look at ourselves and talk talk amongst Mm -hmm. ourselves because it just doesn't seem like we get a uh, a lot of controversy in the fisheries until you're standing in in one of the local sporting goods stores or at a restaurant, and then somebody recognizes you, and then they want to talk about fishing, which does, you know, it's good to talk to them and and, uh, get an idea, but if you want to make a change in fisheries, right now is the time to talk to us because this is before we go to print. 
This is before we're, we're starting to make the management plans and, and the rules. So get a hold of us and uh, talk to us about what you'd like to see changed. And I was going to say, uh, you know, you've opened up the doors for a lot of these public meetings. It's been interesting because some have had small turnouts, but others have had good turnouts. Yeah, and, and you know, it's like anything else. If there's something on there that's a little bit controversial that people are really interested in, they show up. But, I mean, I hate to say, well, we're going to plant walleye in every lake in the, in the state to fire people up. You know, some people would be all over that. There's other people that wouldn't, but... You know, you don't want to make false accusations trying to cause controversy to get people to show up, even though well, that's what we sometimes feel like doing just so that we can get more people's feedback, get some ideas. And so, no, uh, come and support uh, your local fisheries. I think part of being a sportsman is doing the right thing when nobody's watching and showing up to these public meetings and helping us manage them. I mean, we know what we can do to manage biologically, but... These meetings are where you can put your input in. Um, other people get upset. Well, they say, oh, yeah, you say you say we can give our input, but whatever I say never happens. Well, we also get feedback from other people. And so if you've got something that you'd like to see happen, work it as a group. You know, come in and talk to us. The more people we can see that want to move that direction, uh, the more apt we are to move that direction. We're, we're trying to do things, manage these animals by consensus. It's a democratic state, and so it's like uh, we, tr we try to as long as we're uh, managing them for their success in the future. The one area that I see people when something like this comes up, there's an opportunity for input that, that really they get worked up is if there's ever going to be like a change in limit, but that doesn't happen very often. No, the change in limit and, you know, uh, yeah. Sometimes I think fishing is just so good right now that nobody's worried about it. They can go out and then catch a fish anytime they want. And there's some truth to that. But if you want to see things different, you know, or, you know, anything you want to see, you just need to come in and, 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 and we'll have that information uh, next, uh, next show. We have a caller looking to join us, and I do want to point out a telephone number if you'd like to reach Kelton Hatch from Idaho Fish and Game while he's with us on News Radio 1310. KLIX and News Radio 1310.com, 208 736 And caller, you're on the air. Yes. Uh, the concerning uh, fish size, the, the bass in the Snake River from Shoshone Falls to Milner Dam are. I'm going to say so many and so starved, they don't get any size, yet we have a, a, a length limit of 12 inches. And there's so many in there, you can go down and catch hundreds in no time, and yet they have no size, there's not anything big enough to keep. And I, I feel like there isn't a food source there for them to grow. Uh, he can comment on that, please. You, you know, I think he makes a good point. I'm not a big bass fisherman, and I... And I'm, and I'm sorry I'm not up to speed as much as I should, but typically we see that happen in, in other fish populations when you get a high population. And you and you have, I mean, you even see it in deer and elk hunts when you put a point limit on them. All of a sudden, you know, you have a two-point season. Well, there's no two points out there because everybody shoots them. Well, the same thing happens with when we put a 13-inch bass limit on fish. As soon as a fish hits 13 inches, it goes into the krill and it leaves all these little ones. And so, and we do see some stunted growth in some of our populations on, on bluegill as well as bass and things like that. And so I think that's a great comment on there. That's something that I would love uh, you to give and forward to Doug McGargle. Um, I'll, I'll pass it on, but it'd be good coming from you because you're the, you're the, the guy that's out there catching all these fish. And if other people are seeing that, you know, that's how we can, uh, organize these, uh, the change these management plans is through sportsman's input. We go out and we electrofish these streams. We we do some fishing ourselves in different areas, but not everybody's. Uh, I'm not a big bass fisherman. I I, I like salmonids. I I still like eating rainbow trout. I mean I may be one of the weird ones, but I grew up on rainbow trout and stuff like that. And so and I've caught a few bass, but we get comments from people like this that are out there every day and it, and it helps us to understand what's going on a little bit better because we got a lot of miles of streams and reservoirs and so 
appreciate the comment. Think I think you're probably right on top of it on on the money because you're there. It sounds like quite a bit. And if you could forward that to Doug or uh, and I will. But uh, that was a good comment. Appreciate it. We have another caller. Caller, you're up next. You're on KLIX. Yeah, thank you. Uh, the water up in Opie Reservoir is open now. There's very little ice on it, but you won't see any boats on it because there's no fish in it. They need to plant Opie Reservoir. And there's so much pressure on it that it's fished out, and they don't plant it enough. And I personally would like to see the fish limit down to three so that it can uh, sustain itself somewhat. Thank you. I appreciate that comment. That's one of, and sir, on that on that limit right there, um, we we get a lot of feedback in on Oakley. It's a popular place, and it's becoming more popular every day. Um, as we see the populations grow in the Twin Falls area, and this has been a major debate or discussion, I guess not debate, but a discussion on what our fish limit should actually be. Should we maintain a six fish fish limit, or you know, should we move everything back to two or three or have, you know, have a general fish limit, something different? And so those are some of the things that we're going to be discussing. And I do appreciate your comments on that. Um, and I'll pass that on to Doug also. But um, if you can give him a call, that would be awesome because he, he manages it and you can sit down or make an appointment and go into the office and he keeps his door open to anybody that wants to talk. We've got about a minute and a half before the first break. I, I do want to point out another topic on fishing. Uh, Trout in the classroom. Uh, apparently, they don't school, but they will be in the classroom. <laughs> yeah, they, <laughs> that's pretty good, Bill. <laughs> no, um, I just go. I throw this out there about every year we get started on this. Trout in the classroom is a program that we have going in the Magic Valley. We ha- we'll have about three thousand students that'll go through TIC this year. And what TIC is is we ask your kid um, that is in middle school. So we got a couple high schools, but um, typically we target the middle schools. We bring a fish tank in. We bring some uh, eggs, they hatch the fish out, we go and we talk about what it takes to raise a fish in a hatchery and what it takes to raise a fish in the wild and give them a presentation, give them some, uh, take a class period for all those kids. Then we come back and we dissect fish with all these kids. And then the last thing is, is our big hoorah, is we take all these kids fishing in April. And so, uh, well, in April, May, in the very first couple of days of June, just that for their last uh, fish uh fish out and take them on a hatchery tour, take them fishing, um, cook fish for them, let them taste fish. It, it's been a pretty w- rewarding program. Um, and the reason I say that is because when I go into a typical classroom in Idaho, which really shocked me, uh, only in some, it, I mean, it varies. I've gone from 10% of the kids that have ever been fishing to 50% of the kids that have been fishing. I've gone from 0% of the kids that have ever caught a fish to 20 to 30 percent of the kids that ever caught a fish in our magic valley schools on average less than 20 percent of the kids have ever caught a fish we live in idaho we're the rainbow capital of the world (laughs) you know we've got bass bluegill uh sturgeon we got a a wide variety of stuff and so that's why this i i try to throw this out there because i i think it's a good program if anybody's interested in helping uh give us a call at the regional office and i'd love to talk to them about helping us get out and and uh, do some of the fishing events with us. We've got more coming up with Kelton Hatch. He'll be here another 40 minutes. We're at 920. Bill Colley with you as well on Top Story on News Radio 1310, KLIX, and News Radio 1310.com. Our guest in studio is Kelton Hatch. He's joining us from Idaho Fish and Game. Uh, he's here for the entire second hour of the program. We're at 35. Bill Colley with you as well on Top Story on News Radio 1310, KLIX, and News Radio 1310.com. A telephone number if you'd like to reach Kelton while he's in studio. Two zero eight seven three six zero three hundred. Quick note: We've talked a lot on this program, even before I was joined uh, by EGT Solar. That's Even Green Technology as a sponsor on the program. We've talked at length about the future of solar power, which is going through a tremendous revolution and will someday. I, I and I really do believe this. I think it could eliminate want throughout our world. Uh, but I wanted to bring this up. We will be joined by a representative of EGT Solar on Monday morning during the program. Uh, we're going to talk about the future of solar energy. Right now, though, if you're interested in actually setting this up, EGT Solar is the largest and most trusted electrical licensed solar company in Idaho. And if you'd like to talk more with them and get some details, as the weather, of course, has been really nice. You could even be getting these installed now and not even uh, wait until spring. Telephone number 208-293-9191, 208-293-9191, or online at evengreentechnology.com. 
Uh, we have a caller with us right out of the break. Caller, you're up next. Oh, we'll try a, we'll try the other line then. Caller, you're on the air with Kelton Hatch. Go ahead. Kelton, we got a big dog problem in Boyden County. Huge. You know, the Nature Conservancy has closed their area for dogs and has pushed the problem right on down to Lower Silver Creek. And I got a problem with hunting dogs. And but uh, wow, what a mess! Uh, and we got a new critter running around. I ran into one the other day. It's a giant mastiff pit bull cross. And this little hundred pound lady trying to hang on to this thing. I mean, it looks something between a grizzly bear and a, a rabid wolf. <laughs> so I don't know. But there's no way that lady could control a dog like that, even on a leash. It goes after somebody. Uh, is there any way we can control these dangerous dogs on public lands or around uh, fishing areas and hunting areas? You know, about the only way that I know that can happen is if it becomes a county ordinance on most of it. Because public lands, I mean, they we usually don't have any type of controls. There is a rule out there that, I mean, if we see animals harassing wildlife and we can't find the landowner, we can remove them. And so um, if they're chasing deer and elk like that, and that's about as far as our jurisdiction goes. I mean, law enforcement can also, but I would probably call your county or your uh, the city if it's in the city or the county. or. But like on our access areas, that's if it's one of our access areas, that's something that I would like to discuss. I mean, it does sound like an issue up there because we've got several access areas and some pieces of fish and game land up there, and, and we could very easily put a... Uh, a, a, a dog, some type of a management on them, whether it's a, a leash law or or something like that. But that that may be something to to bring up at one of our next meetings, but staff meetings. But for the other stuff, just letting them run at large, uh, that's kind of out of our our bailiwick. But I appreciate the call. And my my dad, one of the sadder parts of his job used to be when he was a park ranger, uh, the lake back home would freeze, and if you looked at it on a map from over over the top of the map, east to west, the lake looked like a great big boomerang, and so it had these corners, and uh, the deer would get chased from the road where those corners were out under the ice, and the dogs would attack him because the deer is slipping all over the place. Oh, yeah. And my dad's job at that point was he didn't enforce leash laws, but once they actually attacked animals, his job was to go out and shoot the dogs. Uh, yeah. was a very sad part of the job. Yeah, and, we, and we've had to do that. And last year we had multiple incidences where people's – dogs and Haley and Bellevue and, and on the outskirts of Ketchum were killing deer last year because the snow was deep. And so th those are the things that uh, we really need to be people will be aware of. Hey, I, I love my, I've got dogs. Got too many dogs probably. However, I mean, part of the ownership of that dog is, is, is managing it and taking care of it. I wanted to point out since we're talking about uh, creatures uh, such as deer and elk and the like and uh, other uh, animals that are out there, and sometimes they are prey, obviously, for domesticated animals. Uh, but more often, we'd like to talk about the fact that uh, they are—they are prey for a domesticated animal like myself, right? Domesticated, <laughs> domesticated, two-legged animals. Yeah. Um, and you wanted to mention the elk harvest. You know, I was going to go through our harvest stats. We just had a commission meeting yesterday. Nothing really big uh, was changed. I mean, we was looking at dropping the regulations back to from two years to one year. That didn't pass. Was looking at, uh, you know, we had some testimony on making the sawtooth zone uh, a controlled hunt because it sells out in five minutes and ten minutes. Um, they didn't get enough support at the meeting to uh, and support online to change anything. And I know some people are going to be really upset about that because I've had an earful on this. And um, however, they we didn't get enough comments opposing having the over-counter sell. And so at this time, we're probably going to continue with the over-counter sell of the sawtooth zone instead of making it a controlled hunt. And uh, I know a few of you are going to be a little bit fired up about that, and I can understand it. But I w what I w along with part of that, we had a report on what this year's harvest results from the information that we've gathered so far. And it's pretty interesting to me. Um, general elk, elk success was 22% for archery hunters and over-the-counter bull tags and things like that, which in the Frank Church and some of those areas that are general general elk hunting. Um, so that was actually pretty good. Our controlled hunts were right at a 
and our over-the-counter elk, uh, well, it was about uh, all elk hunts were over 28% harvest success. Um, we have a, we feel like things are going pretty good with the elk hunting. Uh, last winter didn't have a lot of impact um, on elk numbers, and so uh, numbers and har harvest success has been really good this year. This year on whitetail, I thought was pretty interesting. We killed almost uh, 30,000 whitetail, which is quite a few whitetail for Idaho. I mean, considering we're not, we're kind of a mule deer elk state, but we've seen an increase in our uh, uh, our uh, whitetail oh, population. Oh, they breed like rabbits. They, 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 we get a lot of them, and they, and they live in marginal habitat where mule deer won't. I mean, they'll live in your backyard, and it doesn't bother them. And so that that had increased quite a bit. Um, on our uh, mule deer harvest this year, there's going to be some debate on this um, because a lot of people didn't feel that was it. We're, but we're running about a 35% harvest success on our general hunts. Um, I know not every unit was quite that good, um, but we did have some pretty good harvest success this year. We had uh, had some severe winter kill for the uh, two-point bucks in eastern and western Idaho, but for the Magic Valley, we've done pretty good. So... I'll come back and talk to you about the rest of that stuff a little bit later, but uh, that, we've got some pretty good numbers coming out. We've got more coming up with Kelton Hatch from Idaho Fish and Game on News Radio 1310 KLIX, News Radio 1310.com. Bill Colley as well on Top Story. Joining us in studio this morning is Kelton Hatch from Idaho Fish and Game. We're coming up on 934, and we have 34. Bill Colley with you as well, and a telephone number if you'd like to reach us. Is 208-736-0300, 208-736-0300. And uh, Kelton was wrapping up a couple of details on harvests. Uh, 2017 was an interesting year because we had a string of bad weather uh, events, and it took a while for things to clear out, unlike this year. But uh, it, it had some impact somewhere, and apparently uh, not so much other places. It, and that's exactly how it, it these storms, snowstorms, and winter weather, weather, uh, blah, 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 winter weather events happen. Um, it, it, it's always interesting to me that we can have such a fun winter like we had last year, and then we get such Arizona-like weather this year. Yeah, you know, and so uh, it, it's been interesting, but. Um, I was talking a little bit about the the harvest success from what our preliminary numbers are showing. We're about thirty thousand for whitetail. For the mule deer, we're at about twenty nine thousand, really close to that thirty thousand number, also. So we're estimating our harvest this year at about fifty eight thousand, fifty eight to sixty thousand, because give or take some, because these are estimates because we don't get all our hunter report cards in, and so we have to kind of guess on those on those numbers. For our overall winter survival, we finally kind of got it all all laid out here. And one of the reasons our deer populations have been doing so good is, believe it or not, in the winter of 2010, 2011, we actually had lower fawn survival in the state of Idaho than we did last year, where we were setting at about 25%, 20, well, it was probably setting at about 25, 20, 23% statewide fawn survival. In 2013, 12, 13, we were over 60%. 2014 and 15, we were over uh, right at 80% fawn survival. So we had really bulging, growing populations. And then last year, statewide was at about 30% fawn survival. Um, we had such good numbers because we'd had five years of just extraordinarily good growing conditions for deer. Deer numbers are still looking pretty good. Um, I actually just got done with, uh, we just got done with our, what we call as our composition counts. And what our composition counts are is before the, ant the bucks drop their antlers, we go out and we fly so we can determine how many bucks, does, and fawns are in a population. And so it kind of helped, gives us an idea of whether we're hunting the, the deer, deer population too hard, if we've got too few of bucks. Our, our management plan is to make sure that we have 15 bucks per 100 does in all our GMUs. Um, or game management units. This year in Unit 45, which is most of these units are controlled, except some of these deer that migrate in that area come from up above Fairfield, which is Unit 43 and 48, and those are general hunts. But in we we comped 1,270 deer. Um, we came up with uh, 74 fawns per hundred does, 
and 32 bucks per hundred does. So numbers looked really good. In unit uh, 54 and 55, we came up with uh, 86.2 fawns per hundred does out of, we comped 732 deer. Um, so we had about 86.2 uh, fawns per hundred does, and we had 37.6 bucks per hundred does. And so our buck to doe ratios and our fawn uh, survival for this uh, this winter are looking really good. We're anticipating uh, things to be really good. The hard part right now, Bill, have you ever tried to fly? Did, I mean, you you've been around the country and you've seen. Um, do we have a lot of wide open spaces in Idaho? Yeah. Okay. The overwhelming thing right now is we're trying to do a population count, where we try to count every deer that we can try to in a given GMU or game management unit. And this year we're supposed to do unit 45. Well, they're flying it right now, and we've got deer as high as 8,000 feet up into units 44 that typically, because we got radio collars. We've got 1,000 radio collars on deer in Idaho. So we can kind of uh, determine where they're migrating, and we use it for a lot of different things, survival and stuff. But those deer that typically we're gonna we're having to gonna have to kick it up to almost uh, 120 hours of flight time to try to get an estimated population of those because if you got some snow and it pushes them down into a winter range, it's a lot easier to count them than when they're scattered from 8,000 feet down to 3,000. So it's uh, it, our, our I think our uh, biologists are gonna have uh, TB tired backsides from flying <laughs> around in a helicopter for 120 hours. A quick note that I took when you were mentioning the trout in the classrooms. Uh, you know, you talk about uh, how you try to show the the children, the, the teenagers, how they're raised. And I'm remembering when I was probably 8 or 10 years old, times have changed, but I used to be allowed to wander a lot in a rural area. Mm -hmm. And I would walk down this road, and in springtime, uh, about half a mile from the house was a pond, and you'd see all of the frogs' eggs yeah. and they're in big clusters. So I, I took a bucket down there. Actually, it was a bucket I used for fishing. And I scooped out some of those clusters, right. took them home, and I put them in a pond at home. And it's a good lesson to see how many of those actually hatch. The reason there's a lot of them is because most don't hatch. Oh, yeah. Then the ones that do, the survival rate until adulthood is slim. I mean, and that's oh, it public is. doesn't recognize that. Uh, we've got more coming up with Kelton Hatch in just a few minutes. 20 minutes away from 10 o'clock. Uh, News Radio 1310 KLIX and News Radio 1310 .com. Our studio guest is Kelton Hatch. He's joining us from Idaho Fish and Game, and we're coming up on uh, 943. Bill Colley with you as well on Top Story. We're at 35, and I thank you for joining us. Telephone number if you'd like to reach Kelton, 208 736 0300. 208 736 0300. I also wanted to point out uh, we had a great visit yesterday talking about influenza. Uh, with Dr. Jonathan Tripp. The doctor or one of his associates will join us again next Wednesday on the program. I'd like to remind people Dr. Tripp and his staff are still looking for new patients. As a patient of Dr. Tripp and the staff, they can generally see you on the very same day if you call with a medical issue. If not, they'll see you within 24 hours. The office is located on Vilmore Street in Twin Falls, directly across from the main post office. And also remember, life's too short not to feel good. We have a caller joining us. Caller, you're up next. You're on the air on KLIX. Yes, sir. I want to say I appreciate your program. And uh, I just wanted to mention to the, uh, the gentleman with you that that must be a really uh, a difficult profession to be in because it really does require participation by the users of these areas. And I, I, I think that's pretty, pretty great in some ways, but it can be kind of a letdown in others if people don't participate because – we pretty much control how how well these things uh, work or don't work. That was all. Well, I appreciate that. No, and 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 I feel for people because I understand that they're busy and they've got other other things. But it, it's exactly right. If if you want to have input, otherwise we end up doing what we feel is the best or what we think is best. And I guarantee some of it's biased by our own our own wants and desires because all of us are hunters. But our, our overall goal is to make sure we're trying to do the best for wildlife to ensure their future as well as give people the opportunities they're looking for. And so, uh, no, I appreciate your comments, and uh, 
hopefully people will get out and participate. It's been nice to get some uh, some more management type calls, you know, today about what people would like to see with fishing and stuff like that. I just hope they continue carrying this forward and uh, and uh, attend these public meetings and uh, make their thoughts heard. Yeah, you know, you mentioned that. And one thing that strikes me is the name of the office is Idaho Fish and Game. Mm-hmm. And you can tell a lot state by state about how the offices operate. Uh, mm-hmm. Some are fish and wildlife. Mm-hmm. Others are departments of conservation. Mm-hmm. Others are departments of environmental protection. Mm-hmm. Natural um, resources departments. Right. And, stuff. And, and, you know, yeah, the Department of Natural Resources in Maryland, and mm-hmm. they don't ask the public for input. They basically yeah. say, this is it, you know, take it or leave it. And, and, and just in the wording of this, that that's it is a it is a a, a, a what you call a, a a partnership between the state and the people in Idaho. You, you bet. And I always, you know, I kind of call it we're a hook and bullet our organization. I mean, we are a dedicated fund agency, meaning we receive zero tax dollars from the general public. If you don't buy a hunting and fishing license, you do not pay for management of Idaho's wildlife. In no way, shape, or form. We don't get any taxes from the general tax fund. We get it from hunters and fishermen. We also get what we call a federal excise tax, which is the Dingle, Johnson, and Pittman Roberts funds, from when you buy a a firearm or a fishing pole or fishing-type equipment. There's an excise tax that we we get to help pay for it. And then we, we, I take it back, I guess, you know, uh, we get money from Bonneville Power because they've got hydro dams and things like that. And so that's a a tax that they're given because of the loss of a resource, they pay us back to make sure we don't lose that resource, that we can throw that money back into fish and wildlife to make sure that there's still fishable populations of fish out there. And they do a lot for our fisheries program, Idaho Power. And so there's some, but it is a, it's a, it's a, it's a dedicated fund agency. And so if you're not participating, you're not paying. We were talking earlier about the just the vastness of what we see in places like Idaho, and uh, off air we were talking about, and I, I don't mean to laugh about it, but uh, fifty some odd bison, fifty two might have been the number escaped in uh, Yellowstone Park, and uh, they were ready for shipment to a tribe that was going to look after them, and, and look they're the size of an F one fifty at least, but nobody <laughs> knows where they are and i was joking with benito this morning i said they're hiding behind trees uh, but actually finding them because they're going to start ranging immediately and mm. you know trying to find them and track them down is not going to be easy no and and, and wildlife they move to the winds i mean we we're also talking a little bit about the moose and stuff like that and uh you know it's been amazing since i've been here we didn't have a moose hunt in unit 54 now we got the premier moose hunt in the state of Idaho in Unit 54. That's that the South Hills just south of Twin Falls. And um, we've been seeing moose over by Oakley Rogerson and in the Three Creek area. Well, you talk to those old cowboys up there, and they're going, huh? I've never seen a moose up here. You know, and all of a sudden, moose are starting to show up, and they've been out there cowboying for 100 years, and they've never seen a moose up there. And so we're starting to see moose down there. And so these critters, I mean... If the habitat's good and they're, the populations are strong, they do migrate. There was one apparently that was taken illegally in Elko County. And my experience in Elko County is other than maybe going to a, a garbage is, uh, you know, the, that's wooded in that area. That could be good habitat for moose, but most of the county is... Not good for moose. It's good, right. for, good, good for rattlesnakes and chuckers. <laughs> so, but, so there's, obviously, some of these are just wandering through. Well, no, but they find little habitat niches. They don't need a huge amount of area to support one animal if they're not being harassed. I mean, and that's the beauty of Nevada and Idaho and, you know, Idaho where population is growing like crazy. But um, there's still these hidey holes that critters can get into, these big moose, that it doesn't take a lot of room for them to to survive um, because they really don't have to migrate down because of deep snows and stuff. I mean, they're, you know, they're, they're big, long-legged critters. I mean, and so if they get some good willow, marshy bottoms with some conifers and some uh, quakies around and stuff, they, they can carve out a good living. They can, they can do it. And so, no, I, it wouldn't surprise me. I'm sure they probably got a few moose tags down in the area. But for the most part, they couldn't utilize 
I always like to tell hunters and stuff like that, I said, yeah, we've got tons and tons of open space out there. There's only about 10% of that habitat that's suitable for the certain types of wildlife. They have a habitat niche that they live in. And then other animals use the other other habitat. And some of them take 100 square miles to, to, to carve out a, a chunk of ground to live on. And others take two or three feet to carve a chunk of livelihood out on, you know. And so um, it, it's pretty cool with these the animals and the diversity of animals we have in Idaho and this part of the state. And I'm told if you actually want to see a moose in the South Hills, generally around sunrise, you can spot them. And that's when they like to get a drink of water and... You know, uh, daylight and dusk, I mean, they're moving. But moose, you know, they'll, they'll move through the daytime hours if it's cool. And and so, yeah, it, it's kind of fun to get, get to see them um, up in there. And, uh, you know, deer and elk are the same way. I mean, they move at daylight, daylight and dusk is their main parts. That's why we're always harping on people to slow down, be careful, look for eye glint on the edge of the road because that's when they're moving. So. See, and I, I worry about the safety. I showed you a picture a couple of years ago I took over at uh, – Grand Teton Park, where massive bull, he walked across the road, and, and then he took off down a bike trail. Yeah. And as I was driving after the road, after he cleared and I could get across the bridge, I realized cyclists were coming that way. And I almost wanted to pull over and say, hey, there's a enormous moose coming down the, down the trail. Yeah. I'm sure they saw him, and they're shy enough that generally the moose isn't going to want to battle. But if you're up in the South Hills, the last time I was up there when the, when the weather was good, uh, I saw a lot of people out there uh, uh, four-wheeling, and mm-hmm. a good place to do that, a lot of fun. But if you're out there four-wheeling, uh, chances are at some point somebody's going to encounter one of these guys. Yeah. And, and the issues that we always have with wildlife is they think, well, look how big and placid and quiet they are. Oh, they're going to be afraid of me. Um, there's more injuries caused by moose than there are by grizzly bears, you know, uh, they can get very protective of their calves during breeding season. The bulls can get very aggressive. And so my rule of thumb is if you if you can see it, you're close enough. You don't need to sneak in and try to take a picture of it with your cell phone because you're always – and that's where they always have all the issues up in Yellowstone. And, and these animals can become territorial. They can be protective. Uh, they can be having a bad day like anybody else. And so just give them a wide berth and uh, enjoy them from a distance. This time of year, especially, we're starting to get horn hunters out because, uh, you know, it was interesting. The other day I was out, and all the bucks were still carrying their antlers. A few days ago when we was flying, we saw some of the deer had just started dropping. Even though it's been a mild winter, we don't try not to – please don't cause resource damage by driving off-roads. That's one thing that I've seen has been really bad this year is a lot of people that uh, – have been driving into areas that were closed to drive. Um, we've had some resource damage in some of the some of these areas. Uh, people aren't respecting the rules um, that they should be, uh, and it's not just side by sides and four wheelers. It's pickups and everything else. During antler hunting season, we get people that'll be trying to follow deer herds or elk herds, and they're up in areas they're not supposed to be on motorcycles and UTVs and everything else, and so. Just, I mean, there's more and more of us in Idaho try to respect the resource that we have and uh, not destroy it for the future. You know, and you referenced the fact that they can look calm if you see them grazing or getting a drink of water. And I've, I've seen moose in the wild where they'll come down to the streams by the road, but they don't stay long if there's people around anyway. Uh, but uh, my other encounter with a great big bull uh, was in Vermont many, many years ago, and he saw me on the road. He was standing on a bluff. He took off and ran. Yeah. But I was in the car, which is a little different. If I had been standing there, it might be a different situation. I think about uh, the bison story. And when my uh, my daughter and niece were little, I took them to uh, an amusement park in Canada. And uh, they also had a, a big open area where they had a lot of animals, too, as well. And they had a huge area that was fenced off with bison. And the girls could stand by the fence, and the bison just calmly were grazing on the other side. But we forget that that group of bison is fairly domesticated. Mm-hmm. It's like it's like domesticated cattle. So they see thousands of people who go by every day. Every day. And they're not even phased by that. But if you see a bison standing out of the wild or in even in a national park, it's a different story. That that especially if it's a bull, it's not likely uh, used to having a lot of people approach it. And that's exactly right. So you just have to use caution. One thing I was going to mention, you know, you're you're exactly right on, on these animals reacting different. Um, Starkey is a, a, a research institute, 
and they had ran a uh, survey, I mean a project on mule deer where they had actually put heart monitors on these deer on the Starkey Research Center. And deer out of, a uh, mule deer, white tail didn't show the signs, elk didn't show the signs, but mule deer, when people came within a quarter mile of them and they could see people, their heart rate increased. Um, a lot of other wildlife aren't like that. Mule deer are quite high strung, and, and because of continual human contact with mule deer in certain times of the year, a lot of people get upset that we they've got this uh, mule deer closure down in the South Hills that went into effect on the 50, on the 16th. Well, there's a reason for that. It, in all truthfulness, it should probably start a little bit earlier um, if we're trying to actually protect the mule deer because of their their abilities that you people can still walk down there and do all that type of stuff but it does increase their their heart rate which makes them burn more calories which is less likely for them to survive hard winters and so people need to kind of keep that in mind when they're out there doing different things you know when you how close is close enough to a herd of mule deer because if i get much closer they're going to be burning more calories because i am pushing them more and their heart rates are going up more and they are quite a high-strung critter. And so just some things to, you know, a lot of this stuff you, you, you don't get to know unless you're studying it or living it every day. And so uh, it, it's, uh, it's pretty interesting the way nature and all those things work. Well, and we should also point out, too, when we reference some of the bigger animals, and they'll be territorial, especially if the young are around, uh, we'll be approaching calving season for a lot of these animals soon. Well, it, it's gonna it's a little bit out there because we usually don't see Towards things spring. until June, yeah, till around June, uh, end of May, first of June, and stuff like that. But they're they're putting on their uh, the fat, trying to get you know. And I think we're gonna have really good success. Um, people look at these numbers when I tell them, you know, oh yeah, we uh, we're we're looking at eighty percent fawn survival and stuff like that. That's eighty. Uh, I mean, eighty fawns per hundred does is huge. But a lot of people don't understand. We started out with 150 fawns per hundred does, and so even if we have an 80 fawn per hundred doe population, we've lost 50 percent of the fawns, nearly 50 percent of the fawns already. 75 fawns per hundred does we have lost, you know, and so we get a lot of comments on that too. Well, they see some mortality, and there's well, wildlife is a little different than the human race. I mean, we don't have hospitals; we put them all into, and so there is naturally occurring mortality with every one of these populations and and fortunately in some ways it, it happens because otherwise we'd be overpopulated in, in a lot of ways ways you just talking about how uh your frogs and stuff had different uh it, that's one thing that's kind of fun about the trout in the classroom program you know you get talking about all these different uh things that different fish species have for survival uh like carp lay 100,000 eggs. A rainbow trout lay, lays 3,000 eggs. Well, why is that? Well, typically carp were evolved in really mucky, murky, nasty water, had really low survival. Now they're in Idaho, they're in clean, pure water, they have huge survival and they overpopulate our streams and then the rainbow trout can't even live in them. And so it, it, it's pretty interesting, the dynamics of wildlife. We want to thank you for coming by and we'll see you again in a few weeks. Uh, the weather will... Uh perhaps start cooperating a bit more. But. Well, hopefully we get a little bit of snow and just everybody be safe out there and have fun. I want to thank Kelton Hatch for dropping by from Idaho Fishing Game this morning. Uh, we're at 36, Bill Colley as well. Uh, tomorrow we're talking firearms between 9 and 10 o'clock in the morning right here on News Radio 1310 KLIX at newsradio1310.com. God willing, if the creek don't rise, they'll allow him to come back all over again tomorrow morning.